The emergency was one of the darkest moments in Indian history. It was a time when democracy and civil liberties were suspended, political dissent was punished with imprisonment, and the press was censored. And at a time when the country needed it the most, our legal and judicial system failed us. The emergency was imposed by Indira Gandhi on the night of June 25th, 1975, and it was proclaimed because of the verdict in one case. It was a case that forever changed the course of our country. It was, as renowned lawyer Prashant Bhushan dubbed it in his magisterial book on the subject, truly the case that shook India. It was the case of Indira Gandhi versus Raj Narayan. To understand the case, we have to go back to the year 1969. The rising political ambitions of Indira Gandhi had resulted in the Congress party splitting into two rival factions, Congress R, led by Indira Gandhi, and Congress O, led by Moraji Desai. To consolidate her power, Indira Gandhi advised the President of India, V. V. Giri, to dissolve the Lok Sabha on December 27, 1970 and call for elections in early March 1971. Indira Gandhi was going to contest the election from her stronghold, Rai Bareilly. Given her popularity, a number of opposition parties, including Congress O, had formed an alliance and on January 19, 1971, announced that their candidate in Rai Bareilly would be Raj Narayan. Raj Narayan was an extremely popular leader who had been a well-known freedom fighter and was now a staunch critic of Indira Gandhi. He seemed like the perfect foil for her. Although Raj Narayan was quite convinced he was going to win the election, much to his dismay, when the election results were declared, Indira Gandhi had won by a huge landslide of more than 1,10,000 votes. Raj Narayan felt there were dirtier games afoot. Raj Narayan initially um, was convinced that uh, uh, this was a case of uh, manipulating the uh, ballot papers and he came to my father. Prashant Bhushan's father is the legendary lawyer Shanti Bhushan, who was approached by Raj Narayan with a conspiracy theory. The, at that time, the propaganda was that uh, the chemically treated ballot papers had been brought from Russia and uh, the position was already a mark on the Congress symbol had been made which was not visible and now the stamp which the voter put on the electoral, electoral uh, paper slip this would disappear during the period that the boxes will keep in stored and the uh, earlier mark will reappear and that is how, uh, that was the propaganda but then Raj Narayan was known to be a bit of an eccentric character. Raj Narayan at that time was uh, widely regarded as a clown. And as I have written in this book also, he had spent almost half of his life, even after independence, in jails because of agitating on various issues, sometimes not very serious issues. Uh, so he was regarded as one of these professional agitators um, and not taken very seriously by people. He could not be threatened and he could not be coerced. He could not be bought. He was an honest politician and a very brave one. He had been to jail for so many, on so many occasions for different agitations. But while Raj Narayan imagined ballot tampering, Shanti Bhushan saw an opportunity to file an electoral petition with far more substantial charges of corrupt practices under the Representation of the People Act 1951. My father uh, realized that this, was, this could be a serious uh, election petition and uh, he told Raj Narayan that it should be then uh, it should be then drafted and fought as a serious election petition with uh, several charges of corrupt practice. So my father 
felt that there were a number of serious charges of corrupt practices that could be made and said that I will have to create new charges which in my opinion might ultimately hold. So I decide redrafted the petition. So what were the issues that he added to the petition? The primary one was that she took the help of various government servants for the purposes of her election by way of uh, getting the district officers to construct election rostrums where she could address her election meetings by getting Air Force officers to fly her to various places to address the election meetings uh, by uh, taking the help of her own private secretary who was a government servant who became her election agent, Yashpal Kapoor, for her election. And also the issue of uh, spending more than the limit provided for elections, as well as using a religious symbol, because she used the symbol of, at that time the Congress symbol was of uh, cow and calf, and cow is regarded as a religious uh, object in many, at least among, in the minds of many people. So ultimately, the election petition was mainly focused on these issues. The petition was filed at the Allahabad High Court on April 24, 1971. Although many of the issues were either deleted by the court or dropped by the petitioners during the course of the trial, the case hinged on a few critical issues. One was the issue of Yashpal Kapoor. Mr. Kapoor was a trusted aide of Indira Gandhi and she had asked him to be her election agent. But had he begun to work in Mrs. Gandhi's campaign while still a gazetted officer of the government of India? It was claimed by Mrs. Gandhi's counsel that Mr. Kapoor had tendered his resignation on January 13, 1971 and that it had been orally accepted by January 14. However, the petitioners pointed out that the official order accepting the resignation was only passed on January 25th and hence, till that time, Mr. Kapoor was still a gazetted officer. The principal private secretary of the Prime Minister who went, appeared as a witness and said that the resignation had been accepted with the retrospective effect from before he became the election agent. So I, my argument was, was there any rule, any provision which permitted a resignation to be accepted with retrospective effect? He was not able to point out any rule. Mrs. Gandhi's counsel, S.C. Khare, had decided to produce Yashpal Kapoor in court as a key witness for the case on February 18, 1975. But this proved to be a terrible idea. Yashpal Kapoor, when he appeared, he cut a very sorry figure. When I cross-examined him, he cut a very sorry figure. So probably as Sikh Hare felt that we had to bring Mrs. Gandhi. And once Mrs. Gandhi, a Prime Minister, came, then the judge would not have the courage to decide the case against her. That his, was his psychology, I feel. So the stage was set for Indira Gandhi to become the first Indian Prime Minister to appear in person in a court of law. She was scheduled to appear in court on 18th, 19th and 20th of March 1975. This was the opportunity the petitioners had been waiting for. Because we had no resources, we could not have got evidence of various things. We had only to rely on the legal machinery, summoning documents, opposing the ground of privilege, then cross-examining Mrs. Gandhi. So the cross-examination became very important. It was through her cross-examination that I was able to prove her to be a liar in court. Also to prove that she always believed in using the state machinery for elections. 
A critical issue was whether Mrs. Gandhi had taken the help of the district magistrate and police officers to erect barricades and rostrums and make loudspeaker arrangements for her election meetings. For this, the petitioners had requested a document called the Rules and Instructions for the Protection of the Prime Minister when on tour or travel, informally known as the Blue Book. Blue Book, which contained government instructions as to what steps the administration had to take to ensure the security of the Prime Minister. However, the government had refused to produce this document, claiming state privilege. There is a section in the Evidence Act, I think section 123, under which uh, the government can claim privilege to prevent the disclosure in evidence of a document uh, which the disclosure of which would could endanger public safety, public security or public interest. Justice K. N. Srivastava, who had been presiding over the case, rejected the claim of privilege and Indira Gandhi's counsel appealed to the Supreme Court. Just before that, Supreme Court of United States judgment in Nixon's tape case had come. So I used that and uh, I argued that after all the evidence which is material to decide the basic issues, if that does not come before the court, the interests of justice will suffer. So finally the Supreme Court laid down the principle that ultimately the trial judge has to decide as to whether the interest of confidentiality outweigh the interest of the justice in the case. Actually, interestingly, this was the case in which the Supreme Court for the first time laid down that the right to information of citizens is a part of a fundamental right of free speech and therefore the people who are the real masters in a democracy need to be fully informed about what the government is doing and therefore even the blue book containing security instructions for the Prime Minister is not something which the people cannot know. In the blue book, the petitioners found Indira Gandhi had made a very important change. In the time of Nehru, the, all the meetings addressed by the Prime Minister were to be arranged for by the district administration. Even the construction of the rostrum, even the loudspeakers, everything in connection with all meetings. But it said, except for election meetings, namely election meetings, the arrangements were not required to be made uh, by the administration. It was during the period of Mrs. Gandhi that she got the blue book amended. The result was that even the election meetings, the arrangements were made by the collectors. All the rostrum, loudspeakers, everything. So, but we had to prove that this change had been made with the consent of the Indira Gandhi Prime Minister. Otherwise, we could not have used it. So during her cross-examination, after she decided to appear herself in court, I put a question to her in a tone, suggesting as if this amendment was illegal. I said, but uh, was this amendment made with your consent? So she thought, if she said she did not have her consent, it might get invalidated. She said, yes, of course. It was with my consent. That proved my point, that she, by getting this proviso deleted, was getting the collectors to make their arrangements for her election meetings at, uh, by the collectors. And therefore, it was with her consent that the corrupt practice was committed. So Shanti Bhushan had, for all practical purposes, proven that Indira Gandhi had used district officials to make arrangements for her election meetings. However, there was another issue that had arisen during the trial. On what date 
had she held herself out to be a candidate from Rai Bareilly. A corrupt practice could only be committed by a candidate. So it would only be something which had been done after she had either filed a nomination papers or held herself out to be a candidate, including the expenses that she incurred would only be seen from the time that she had held herself out as a candidate. So uh, one of the important issues was when did she declare that she was going to contest the election from Rai Bareilly. Indira Gandhi claimed that she had not decided to stand for the elections from Rai Bareilly till February 1st, 1971, the date on which she had filed her nomination papers. During the cross-examination, she affirmed this repeatedly. On the first day, I put the question to her about something about when was it decided for your... because it was the party organization parliamentary board which had to finally decide on every candidate. So when did the parliamentary board took that decision on that question? I first day kept on putting that question two or three times to get a clear answer and she gave a clear answer. However, Bhushan contended that she had held herself out to be a candidate from Rai Bareilly on December 29th, 1970, when in a press conference, she had indicated that she did not intend to change her constituency from Rai Bareilly to Gurgaon. Bhushan also had an ace up his sleeve, an additional written statement made in August 1972 in which she had stated, a final decision in regard to my constituency was announced by the All India Congress Committee only on 29th January 1971. Next day, I put that document to her, additional written statement, and first asked her, to identify her signatures as to whether they were her, her signatures, she admitted yes. I said, so you, you said on oath that uh, the, everything is stated in this additional written statement was true? Yes. Then I said, read paragraph so and so. So she read it. I said, now tell the court. Yesterday you told the court in oral evidence just the contrary. Here in writing you are saying just the reverse of it. Please tell the court which of your two statements was true and which of the two statements was false. She fumbled. She could not reply. And that enabled me to argue that she lied on oath. So the petitioners, it would seem, had managed to expose the Prime Minister. Arguments continued for another two months and closed on May 23, 1975. The whole of India waited for any word on the judgment. Finally, it was announced that it would be delivered on June 12, 1975. On that day, the court was swarming with reporters and lawyers. Shanti Bhushan, however, was in Bombay for the Back Bay reclamation case. I was holding a conference with the lawyers there for that case on Monday. Just after 10, I think 3-4 minutes, my brother rang me up from Delhi to say that you have won the case. Mrs. Gandhi's election has been set aside. Justice Sinha found Indira Gandhi guilty of two counts of corrupt practices. He stated that Yashpal Kapoor's resignation became effective only from the date on which the order accepting it was passed, that is 25th January 1971, and since he had worked for her campaign between 13th January and 25th January, it would amount to a corrupt practice. He also stated that it was clear from the evidence that state government officers were used to make arrangements for the election meetings, which also amounted to a corrupt practice. He acquitted Mrs. Gandhi of all other charges, but these two charges were enough for Justice Sinha to declare her election void and also, even more importantly, to disqualify her from holding any public office for a period of six years. 
This was an incredible victory for the petitioners and an unprecedented event in Indian history. The Prime Minister, the most powerful person in the country, had been toppled by a team of mavericks using nothing but the legal system. It was a stunning victory for the underdog, a triumph of the rule of law. Today the people rejoice and reaffirm their faith in the democratic institutions of India. I accept the judgment with humility. But the story had by no means ended. The celebrations didn't last long. Within half an hour, Indira Gandhi's counsel had persuaded Justice Sinha to stay the judgment as they planned to appeal to the Supreme Court. The darkest period in post-independence India was about to begin. Our next video will be on the events that followed. Make sure you watch it.